we are live. Welcome to 2021's Eternals Review and Thoughts 2D. Was not able to watch it in 3D. Now, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I watched this in a theater because where I live, COVID is under control. If you do not live in an area where COVID is under control, please do not watch this in a theater. No movie is worth risking spreading COVID. Even if you think you yourself will be safe, there's probably someone that you might accidentally spread it to that you do not want to spread it to. So, let's... Yeah, so, I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watched, so I'm going to speed faster and so my back feels better. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before you so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and choose to me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise. And as soon as I end the review itself, please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie, including discussing the ending. Yeah, so, if the, yeah, if this is the first of these videos by me that you watch, then just to get you up to speed, I love every MCU movie, they're all in the 7 out of 10 to 10 out of 10 range, although I don't make any excuses for Iron Man 2, and I love every episode that's come out so far of the Disney Plus MCU shows, 10 out of 10 for WandaVision, Captain America and Winter Soldier, Season 1 of Loki, the episodes of, yeah, Season 1 of What If. Now... Content warning and or trigger warning. This movie features the following, and I'm going to be discussing at least some of the potentially triggering content. Torture, kidnapping, ableism slash disability, gaslighting, mental illness, sexual orientation, xenophobia, body horror, Genocide and minorities. Now, right, also please note I have a tendency to sometimes when I'm discussing a sensitive subject use descriptive terms that I consider neutral that other people consider negative. So if, it, if I say something that sounds judgmental, it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive, not judgmental. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Also, the movie has sensitive subjects that I'm not well educated on. I'm going to try my best not to put my foot in my mouth. But if I at some point in this video say something that reeks of soft breath, again, I assure you, I'm not intentionally being disrespectful. Also, I will do my best to pronounce the names correctly. If I get it wrong, it's not that I'm intentionally making fun of them. So the movie is rated PG-13. So is this video. And... Right, so this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. I'll know, but... I mean, I won't know. I'm not druig. I don't have, you know, some mind control ability where I can make people, you know, hypothetically follow you, the viewer, around and you know, report back to me. Certainly if I was, you know, hypothetically, maybe my abilities were on the fritz and it was very frustrating. But I'm 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 dealing with it. I'm coping. Now anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what it's adapting, or the movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing, earlier movies in the franchise. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. So the best of my ability to negative the movies I say in this video are fair criticisms based on budget when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So ultimately you don't need to have watched anything else before watching this. But there are references, 
you know, basically anything that it's, if you watched Infinity War and Endgame, there aren't, I'm not sure there's a single reference in here to the other movies that you'll be confused by. And yeah, you, you can go into this completely without knowing any other. This, this could be your first MCU movie, although if it is, you are, you know, your, your expectations will be very different from what the other movies, but yeah. And, and I, I think that's great. You know, it is like, there's, there's some crumbs here for, for those of us who've been there from the beginning and want to, you know, we want, like, like it means something that it's an MCU movie and not just an, you know, yeah, a movie in another franchise or one that isn't set in a, you know, one that has no continuity with anything, for example. But, yeah, this could easily be your first. I, there are people that I would recommend watch this, but I wouldn't recommend they watch any other MCU movie. And I think that's amazing. I, I really love that they're really getting, you know, yeah, the, the, the kinds of things we see in the MCU. It, it's much broader now. We, we, you know, yeah. Now, I think I will just very briefly say, I personally really like this. I was expecting, I was, I was kind of thinking, okay, so I guess this is going to be the first major disappointment for me in the MCU. The, the first movie where really I, I can try to defend it, but I won't, I, I won't completely love it. You know, I get, I get some of people's criticisms, but I just, I really didn't, you know, some of them I get, but don't think are a big deal, and others, I'm just like, what movie were you watching, but whatever. I don't think, I, I've, in my opinion, it handles everything that it needs to really well, but for sure there are aspects about it, like, a lot of the time it's conversations, and a lot of, like, there's a, a lot of information that the movie has to give you know i watched it with a friend of mine he said you know if you like christopher nolan movies which we do he and i are both big fans of them you know then you don't mind having someone talk at you for a, a significant chunk of a movie and yeah you know a, a lot of the best moments are conversations not and and yeah you know, a lot of this information is told to us, you know, verbally. It, if, you know, that, that is something for sure an argument could be made that a, the movie might have gone down easier if more of it was communicated through visual storytelling. Some things are. But on the other hand, I do, I, I really, you know, and, and certainly the visuals in this movie are incredible. I think, yeah, the rest of it I'm going to get into in specific. So, since, we're, since we are still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you I washed my hands since last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So yeah, this is my first viewing. I watched it today right before now vlogging about it, so it would be fresh in my mind. So yeah, plot. The Eternals are aliens who, you know, arrived on Earth thousands of years before the present, and you know the. Yeah, the the some of the some of their actions have inspired human being us human beings to you know leading to new discoveries, but they're also they're basically not supposed to 
inter directly interfere, but un unless deviants are involved. But following the events of Endgame, something called the Emergence begins, and the Eternals have to, uh, yeah, yeah, have to stop it. So the third snap created the conditions for the emergence because even in death, Tony Stark is going to lead to a threat. Now, so I wrote this this joke that I was going to say. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm just going to start by saying, actually, yeah, never mind. Yeah, I wrote a couple of jokes about, yeah. So the movie takes place over 7,000 years, and through very careful pacing, it feels like it's been it's being presented in real time. See, I I don't actually think that, but I read a lot of people saying it was, you know, felt real. I, I mean, it doesn't, it's not as smooth or as quick-paced as some of the best of the MCU. You know, I'm not sure I would say there's even a single scene that's, you know, that drags anything down in, for example, Civil War. So basically, the Eternals have to get back together. It's kind of like in the Blues Brothers, only instead of Mr. Fabulous, it's the audience protesting vehemently. Again, a joke I wrote before watching the movie, back when I thought that I wouldn't like it. So... IMDb lists this as an action adventure drama fantasy sci-fi. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The, the it, if you haven't already watched it, you're not gonna believe me when I say, it, but this is one of the best dramas I've ever watched. Like this, this, yeah, the the interpersonal drama, the interpersonal conflict, and these conversations and confrontations. Yeah, you know, if if not for the fact, like, there are people that I care deeply about that th they will they will not be able to get into this movie because it's too there's too much sci-fi going on. But if you know, outside of that, yeah, it's it's this it's this group of people. Yeah, I th I think it's fair to call them fam family. It's this family that have, you know, they they. Yeah, it's not a spoiler to say. I'm not going to go into the details, but some of them haven't seen each other for a long time, and when they, and you know, when they meet again, some of them have some issues that they hash out with, you know, yeah, and yeah, it's legit. It's it's touching, and yeah, the fantasy and sci-fi really. Yeah, the, the sci-fi stimulates your brain. It's not ashamed of the fantasy roots. The action and adventure is fun and exciting. You know, it's... Yeah, the... the, the in, in some ways, it sets new standards for some of these genres. It's been a long time since a drama moved me like this. And the fantasy and sci-fi really go places that you don't. Yeah, and yeah, some of the science fiction is hard sci-fi, and let's see. so for those who don't know, I watch and video review pretty much every single comic book adaptation movie that goes to theaters. And I have to admit, it. I don't know very much about the Eternals. If this was not, like hypothetically, if a movie came out called The Eternals, and I didn't know for sure that it was a comic book adaptation, then yeah, I'm not sure I would have watched this movie. I'm really glad I did, though. So... The, let's see, yeah, so the politics of the movie, we have, 
a deaf character, a gay character, there are multiple, let's see, yeah, yeah, Makari is African American, and so is Fasto, so yeah, mul multiple African Americans, we have a Latina, an Asian man, and, you know, the, the, this movie features the first deaf and the, f uh, well, not, yeah, not the first gay, but the first gay character where them being gay actually matters and isn't just, oh, you know, like the end game, you know, he's, this guy is talking about being on a date and then he says, oh, he cried, you know, oh, so they're gay, you know, or, or possibly bi. But they're not straight, you know. But I, I, there's probably people who didn't even realize that he said he just, oh, you know, he's talking about going on a date, and you know. But here it matters, and yeah, I representation is extremely important. I really appreciate how they handled it in in this. I I was really glad to see someone, you know, so, someone pointed out there's. You know, but base like we have multiple different ethnicities. We have young, yeah. You know, like like te, you know, Sprite isn't actually fourteen, but the actress who plays her is, and that is, you know, she is forever trapped in the body of a fourteen-year-old. And then we have. You know, yeah, I, I, I have to admit I did not look up, but I know some of the actors in this. I didn't look up exactly who is, you know, the, the oldest. But yeah, there's, you know, some some forty or fifty year olds in in this movie. So it really it, there, there's yeah, there's representation for oh, and an Indian. I, I believe Kamel Nanjiani, I believe he's Indian. So, yeah. And I, you know, I was a little worried if it was maybe, not not for MCU, but for Hollywood, if it was going to treat the characters with condescension, if there was going to be inappropriate jokes. But, no. Not really. So, so it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty terrible that I have to say the following, but some people won't watch this film if they aren't assured of the following. Not every straight white cis man in this film is depicted as being evil, inferior, etc. There are multiple major characters that fall into those categories. Now, let's see. So the... Some people said that this is the worst of the MCU so far. So, again, before I watched the movie, I, I wrote, Personally, I have a hard time believing it's going to be as much of a mess as Batman v Superman 2016, Suicide Squad, or Wonder Woman 1984. The MCU are more careful to not let one of their movies become a mess. And, yeah, this, this movie isn't a mess. It's got a couple of elements that don't work perfectly, and it's definitely very different from a lot of people were expecting. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that every negative review comes from someone who just didn't expect what they were going to get. Or I'm, I'm not going to be that condescending say, oh, you just didn't get it, man. No, no, no. It is perfectly except I can understand why. Hypothetically, I could imagine understanding why someone would just hate this movie. I don't feel that way, but some people do, and that's perfectly fine. But, yeah, the, the, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that someone, anyone is wrong for criticizing the movie. What I am saying is, if you're not sure if the movie is going to be for you or not, you know, the, there are a lot of great reviews out there that can help you figure that out. And something I will definitely say is that 
a lot of people, it's it's not what you would expect. And, you know, for some people that's positive, for others it's negative. Now, no theater near me had 3D showings, so I cannot comment on the 3D aspect. Now, if this was written by Chloe Zhao, who also wrote Nomadland, the writer songs my brothers taught me. Let's see. Oh, right, and I I Nomadland is on Disney Plus in my country, so I watched it to get a sense of her style. Now it is the only movie by her that you know, these are the only two movies by her that I've watched, but doing a tiny bit of research, I learned that she, you know, that when they were making that movie, they basically, they basically all lived out of vans. And the van she lived out of during production, she called it Akira because she's a big fan of the anime. And yeah, that is, that is one of my favorite anime, one of my favorite manga. That, you know, yeah, big points in, in my book before I went, you know, so, okay, so she's a fan of the MCU and Akira, and, and she has tremendous empathy for some of the people who work the hardest in America. That's just like, yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm definitely going to watch more of her movies. Now, let's see, the, um, right, in addition to her, the movie was written by Patrick Burley, who also wrote, right, they're making another Power Rangers, it's been announced, and he's writing that, or has written that one, I don't know how far they are, and he wrote Peter Rabbit 2, The Runaway, and Ryan Furbo, Furpo, who in addition to writing this, wrote Ruin, which is coming up, and he's known for documentary short directing, and I'm guessing brother, Kaz Furpo, also wrote, you know, upcom the upcoming Ruin, and the story for The Last Maccabee, which is in pre-production, and he's known for writing and directing shorts. And yeah, I there's definitely there's definitely some issues with the writing. You know, I I've, I've seen at least one critic point out that the movie has a lot of really clever ideas and the movie would be better if all of those ideas kind of helped each other, uh, you know, yeah, where in, instead, you know, it's, yeah, they, they don't gel all that well all of the time. Now, this movie does have concepts that need a lot of explaining before you're willing to accept it, and it definitely puts in the legwork for explaining. And I would say most people, again, I really, I don't mean to sound condescending. Most people will understand it from the, the, the explaining. Otherwise, you know, Wikipedia, YouTube videos, maybe give it a second viewing if, you know, that of course depends on like, you know, if you don't if you don't love it the first time, I I don't blame you for not wanting to, not you know running out and and immediately watching it again. Now there are some things in the movie that aren't verbally explained, but they're basically they're demonstrated. You know, some of I I think at least some of the powers they just don't actually tell us verbally. They, they show us, 
you know, we see how it works and that's it. That, you know, you don't need any, yeah. The movie handles plot twists really well. There are not too many, there are not too few. I would say all of them are good. I know not everybody agrees. I definitely don't think they were too easy to figure out for the viewer. And it's not one of those movies that works until you learn the twist, but then it completely falls apart. Like, I'm definitely going to be watching this again, and I'm going to try to pick up on things. But even so, like, watching the movie, like, it's not one of those where I was so... Like, the movie isn't so chaotic that you can't, like, when, you know, when it, when a twist is revealed, you think back to earlier and you're like, that's what that was about, you know? And, yeah, it's, it's, it's things happened in this movie where I was not at all expecting that to happen. I was not expecting to feel the way that I did about certain characters and events. Yeah, it's, I, I, you know, some have called this the MCU's most mature movie. And yeah, I, I think that's absolutely correct. I, 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 I hope that they will make more like this. I doubt all of them will be quite this mature, but yeah, this is a much smarter, deeper movie than a lot. You know, it still does deliver on, you know, the... the. It's got battles, it's got comic relief, and a lot of, you know, settings, and... Yeah, but, but it really... It makes you think. Now... The movie was directed by Chloe Zhao, who also co-wrote it, and she's actually, you know, she's not the sole writer for all, but she has done writing for all of the movies that she's directed, and the, yeah, I respect that a lot. Don't get me wrong. I don't feel like it's a slight against someone if they can't do both, but anyone who can do both and it works out well, that's extremely impressive. And yeah, you know, I've watched two movies that she's written and directed now, and yeah, she's she's incredibly good at it. Now, the opening of the movie does a good job at setting up the Eternals, the Deviants, and giving us, you know, making it clear that the Eternals care about human beings on Earth. I won't give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but... It fits with what came before. I'm extremely happy with how the movie ends. It doesn't have Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And there are two. There, there's a mid credit scene and a post credit scene. So you should sit all the way through the credits and... I'm, I've heard some people, you know, yeah, some, some people weren't that impressed with them. I love both of them. I cannot wait to see them follow up on, but yeah, I, I could definitely acknowledge not everyone will be equally passionate about those. Now... I, yeah, I'm really not very familiar with the Eternals in the comic books. You know, basically everything I know about them is from YouTube. But I do, I, I can tell that they, you know, they picked some things that they, you know, they felt they could make work in the movie. And other things they didn't, you know, and they, there are some things that they changed hugely. And I think they did a really good job. You know, the, the... 
when you read some of the reviews, it sounds like, oh, this is, you know, two and a half hours of a history lesson. All they do is talk about the things. You are told a lot, yes, but it's not just dry information and then they move on. They tell you about a thing and then you understand, like, like it's basic like you you you're told about a thing and then you you see how it affected the eternals how they feel about things you know i would agree that it was terrible if it was just a lot of information and then you know but yeah i don't know i guess the the people who wrote things like that in the reviews just did not Yeah. What's the word? They they didn't really care. They they didn't find it compelling to watch how it affected the Eternals. That brings us to the characters. For some of the characters, you don't you really aren't we really aren't told that much. So, you know, if that means you can't get into, you know, you, you yeah, it, it might be a problem for you to get into this movie, or at least care that much about those characters. And there are also some characters that are not very likable, or at least there are aspects that make them harder to like, and that's also going to alienate some viewers. Now... I would say the movie generates empathy, you know, Roger Ebert, R.I.P., said that movies are empathy machines, and this movie definitely generates empathy for a number of the, yeah, I would say I cared about every single Eternal, and I really thought, I, I thought I was going to be having trouble remembering all of them. You know, and and yeah, I I really got in, I I really care about all of them, and hope to see more with them. Now, let's see. So the yeah, the cast. Gemma Cham plays Cersei, and. Yeah, there's this uh, let's see. Yeah, she uh, yeah, an empath empathetic eternal with a strong connection to humans and the earth who can manipulate inanimate matter. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead and quote, so let's see. Chloe Zhao said she and Chan were interested in creating a nuanced female superhero that is rarely seen in the genre. And Zhao added that Chan brought a beautiful sense of gentleness, compassion, and vulnerability. So the character would invite viewers to rethink what it means to be heroic. And Chan called Cersei grounded and a little bit of a free spirit. And, and, and Chan did... Previous, you know, she was Miner Min Minerva in Captain Marvel, and this, you know, not the same character at all here. So, I really appreciate that they they do this because it's just it's just silly. And you know, others have already pointed out it was a complete waste. J Gemma Chan deserves a much meatier role than she got in that movie, and. I, you know, I guess Kevin Feige realized his mistake, because, yeah, I, I really appreciate that she got to, she, she's incredible in this. And Richard Madden plays Icarus, one of the most powerful Eternals, who can fly and project cosmic energy beams from his eyes, and... 
yeah, the you know, I, I saw someone say that you know, the 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 movie shouldn't bring up Superman because Icarus isn't as compelling as Superman. I mean, are we talking Zack Snyder Superman or are we talking true to the comics Superman? I I really like Henry Cavill. I I I don't know if he's ever gonna play Superman again. I hope he gets other roles where he can really show he I I mean honestly, my favorite performance by him is probably Mission Impossible Fallout. The man has talent. He's he's miscast in in some of anyway. I found Icarus to be significantly more compelling than Zack Snyder's Superman. Now if we're talking like I mean, yeah, it's it's been a while since it was anyone of uh, Joss Whedon's. Joss Whedon's Superman was was pretty decent, but Icarus is just he's such an interesting character. I I will admit that when when we first met him, I didn't necessarily realize that he was going to be that compelling. But yeah, Kumail Nanjiani plays. Kingo, an Eternal who can project cosmic energy projectiles from his hands, and he actually, he becomes a popular Bollywood film star to blend in on Earth, and Nanjiani wanted his performance to combine the wisecracking attitude of John McClane from the Die Hard film series with the look of Bollywood actor... I'm gonna do my best here. Kritik Roshan. He studied Errol Flynn films and some of the original Zorro films to prepare for the role. And Johnny, who is not a dancer, found learning the Bollywood dance is challenging. You know, I, I love Nanjani in Men in Black International. He was one of the only good parts of that movie. I... They better deliver on a Pawnee-centric spin-off. I know some people found him really annoying in this, you know, for sure, like, he is the, the MCU comic relief character, you know, yeah, the, the kind of comic relief character we find in a lot of these MCU movies, and, yeah, for sure, like, at the I I wasn't really I didn't have a problem with him in this movie, but sometimes those can be excessive for sure and yeah. And Leah McHugh as Sprite, an eternal who can project lifelike illusions. Sprite has the physical appearance of a twelve year old with Hugh McHugh calling her an old soul. I, she gives an amazing performance. Like, it is, it is unreal how convincing, because Leah McHugh, I mean, when they filmed this, I'm not sure if it was 12, 14, somewhere around there, and yeah, like, she doesn't, she doesn't feel like a teenager pretending to be thousands of years old. She feels like, a, you know, Someone 7,000 years old who's trapped in the body of a 12-year-old and really frustrated by who she is. She is so tired of people treating her like a child. And I honest, I thought she was going to be just this really broody and angry and annoying character. You know, it's, it's... So many Hollywood movies act like that's, you know... Well, if she's a teenage girl, she's got to be constantly, you know, angry and brooding and such. And there are times where she is, woe, woe is me, but there, yeah, not, not all of the time. And the, the kind of behavior that we see and some behavior that's described that we don't see makes perfect sense. Like she, like she has... She did, she isn't stuck on one specific response to 7,000 years of being treated like a 12-year-old. 
she has multiple different ones. You know, sometimes, like, yeah, sometimes she'll complain and, and such. Sometimes she'll 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 kind of poke and prod and and like say things that might provoke a response and just yeah there's yeah brian tyree henry plays fastos an eternal intelligent weapons and technology inventor and the first superhero to be depicted as gay in an mcu film that's true that it's not the first gay mcu character for superhero and the, you know brian tyree henry also appeared in into the spider-verse and joker now that the fox x-men franchise is no longer active he has appeared in every current comic book continuity i approve and yeah i it's it's absolutely i i, I really love his character now yeah, so the according to MVB trivia, some people had expected Carol Danvers to be openly lesbian, and that that would also have been interesting, because that would also be an interracial relationship, which you know some people really freak out over, and that is something you know we need to normalize the idea of interracial relationships. And and you know you can you can yeah you can easily see how it would you know the the these two young women raising the you know this this daughter together and yeah you know but yeah I mean I I don't know it's it's one of those things anyway I I. Let's see, there's the, yeah, there's a Wikipedia quote here. Actor Haas Sliman portrays Fastos' husband and the pair have a child. And Sliman felt it was important to depict how loving and beautiful a gay family can be, rather than the sexual or rebellious depiction in some previous media. Feige said the relationship was always sort of inherent in the story, and he felt it was extremely well done. While Sliman said it was a thoughtful depiction, I I am I am over the moon for this depiction of of gay. It's 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 beautiful. I I I really hope millions of people you know watch this and and just see oh they're just their parents they're you know they're just good parents like just like straight people they you know gay people can be good parents it, it just yeah i i like every single time you see fastos or i have to admit i i do not remember i'm gonna go with sliman the yeah it's when when you see the two of them trying to trying to raise the the child and trying to make sure that you know he doesn't do anything or hear anything that's that that he shouldn't and and just yeah it's 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 so good and just the the love that they clearly feel not only for each other but also for this child it's just it's it's so sweet and Lauren Ridloff plays Makari an eternal who possesses the powers of super speed. The character is the first deaf superhero in the MCU. And so the yeah, in in the YouTube Marvel 101 video on her character, she she talks about you know because of super speed and oh hold on, was that her or anyway. The the yeah I believe it was it was the the actress who said that you know because she has super speed and has spent thousands of years on Earth she's seen every place on Earth there's nothing new for her to see 
on Earth at all. She's she's bored. She wants to go to other planets, start exploring them. But for now, the mission needs her to stay on Earth. And you know, I've when I just heard that, I wasn't sure. You know, I was like, okay, that's that's a good conflict. Does the movie use that well? Does it establish it well? Or do you kind of need to know this going into the movie in order to realize it's there at all? I would say the movie does a good job establishing and using it. And yeah, I... I the, the, you know, I've, I've watched a bunch of interviews and such. And the actress is just so unbelievably charming and charismatic. And you just, yeah, you, you really care ab about just, yeah. And some critics have said, you know, she's probably going to be a fan favorite. Yeah, I, as, yeah. And, you know, sometimes we able-bodied people have a hard time imagining disabled people living a full life. But here is a depiction of a deaf woman who has lived a very full life and isn't, you know, she's not bored because of things she doesn't have. She's bored because of this extremely long lifespan and her super speed. I, I you know, that's that's an interesting twist on, you know, usually when you see a disabled character and like they're they're sad or upset or something, it's. It's not because they're 7,000 years old and because of super speed, they've run all over the planet. You know, I, I liked turning that on its on its head like that. That was, yeah, there's, a, you know, no nobody is like, like the, the, the other characters don't ignore her or act like it's a hassle to be dealing with a deaf person. The other Eternals know sign language and communicate with her you know like like the, the she doesn't even feel like she's ah what's the word like she's part of the overall unit you know she doesn't feel like she's an outsider you know it's it's not like oh here's another situation where she just can't you know because she's deaf she's not gonna work no every you know like she she's she participates just as much as the rest of them. You know, she's cracking jokes. She's, you know, the, the, the Eternals tend to, like, fight as more of a unit rather than just all of them going off on their own. And she's really good at, you know, tag teaming just like the others are. Barry K K K Kyogen, as Druig and Aloof Eternal, who can manipulate the minds of others. And I have got to watch more of his stuff, because he did an incredible job. And I, I guess I'm not going to go into too much detail with his character. I'll just say that he was, he was incredibly interesting. And according to IMDb trivia, Keanu Reeves, Luke Evans, Rami Malek, Ian McShane were considered for the role of Druid before Barry Keaton was cast. I don't... I like Keanu Reeves a lot. I don't know that he has the kind of... I don't think he's a bad actor, but I'm not sure that he could quite convey as much wordlessly as... Uh, Kyogen and let's see Luke Evans yeah I could see that I have to admit I'm not sure I've seen Rami Malek in anything yes I know I know Ian McShane I could see that yeah and Don Lee as Gilgamesh the strongest eternal with a deep connection to Thena and Lee pursued the role in order to be an inspiration to the younger generation as the first Korean superhero and was able to utilize his boxing training for the role. And yeah, he's he's great. Like you really get a sense. Yeah, he and he and Thena, like he he they kind of need each other. And it's 
it's it's beautiful it's sweet and Harish Patel as Karun Kingo's manager he's basically comic relief but it's yeah he's he's a um, he's he's a fun character and Kit Harrington as Dane Whitman a human who works at the Natural History Museum in London and is dating Cersei now if you know the comic books you know that Dane Whitman isn't just any ordinary human and that's kind of why he's here because of yeah you know and I can understand some people might be frustrated at that especially if you cast someone you know who's coming off of Game of Thrones you know big name but I, I do think that the, the yeah, he's, I, th I think he is going to be a, a very interesting, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. He's, it's going to be interesting the next time we see him. And Salma Hayek as Ajak, the wise and spiritual leader of the Eternals, has the ability to heal and is the bridge between the Eternals and the Celestials. Changing the character from a man in the comics allowed Hayek to lean into Ajax's femininity, make her the mother figure of the Eternals. Hayek was initially hesitant to work with Marvel, assuming she would have a supporting or grandmother role. And, you know, I, I like Sama Hayek a lot. She's very, you know, she very frequently plays strong female characters from what I've seen her, and she's really good at it. And, yeah, she, she did an incredible job here. It's... You know, it's not the first time I've cared deeply about a Salma Hayek character, but I think it might be, I think it is the one where I've cared the most. And according to IMDb trivia, there are some others, you know, apparently they were, all of the, all of the actresses listed in the IMDb trivia note were, are uh, Latina. Ana de Armas, who, I mean, after after Blade Runner twenty forty nine, I will I will, you know. I would listen to her read the phone book. She is unbelievably talented. Isa Gonzalez, I have to admit, I've only seen her in Bloodshot, and that movie does not really give her a lot to do, but I would like to see her in some yeah now yeah and naomi scott i haven't seen her in anything but she plays jasmine in the live action aladdin and she was one of the main characters in charlie's angels 2019 and power rangers 2017 so yeah i guess that's not I don't know. I heard she was good in those movies. The fact that those movies themselves were not good. I hear. I haven't watched them, so I'm not I'm not going to say for sure. And Angelina Jolie as Athena, an elite warrior eternal who can form any weapon of cosmic energy, develops a close bond with Gilgamesh for centuries. Jolie trans trained with various sword spears and staffs for the role, as well as taking ballet. And Jolie said in an interview that her character basically has sort of PTSD, and I have to admit, I I it's one of the best depictions of PTSD I've seen in in a film like. The people who care about her try to avoid triggering her. They they try to to help by being understanding and patient and reasserting that she's safe where she is. Just it is beautiful, and and I really honestly, yeah. I, I really loved seeing that in the movie, and I mean, 
I'm not surprised that Angelina Jolie would, you know, take a role like that and, and do so well at it. You know, a, a movie like Changeling, for example, shows that she is willing to, you know, she, she, she's willing to herself look, you know, yeah, to, to play roles where, like, I, uh, was it, I forget, I want to say, was it director Clint Eastwood, in, in fact, I think it might specifically have been for that movie, where he said that it's almost, you know, that, that like, because Angelina Jolie is so beautiful, a lot of people don't realize that she's also an incredible actress, and, you know, that's one of those movies where she's like, yeah, you know, she could she could choose to just do roles where she's sexy, but she chose to take this role where, like, you know, it's not a sexy movie, it's not a sexy role, and she really, her talent shines through, you know, and that's also about the, the way, you know, people with mental illnesses are treated in society, treated by those that they trust. So clearly this is something that Jolie, yeah, you know, she, she wants to communicate the importance of taking care of people with mental illness. And, you know, Jolie also very, you know, yeah, also frequently plays strong female characters and she's really good at it. It's, it's really cool to me that actresses like Jolie and, and Hayek can still get roles like this. It really shows that they are still, you know, they are incredibly talented. A lot of actresses, you know, sadly, Hollywood doesn't give them good roles or many roles at all. After, I, f I think I read somewhere that was like age 35 or something like that, you know, and yeah, it's, it's, really sad to see and it's I'm always really glad to see when when a woman does keep getting work after that age and it really does prove that you know they are immensely talented or they wouldn't keep getting work or at least not prominent work Like, didn't, didn't, uh, uh, didn't Cameron Diaz go from being the woman that the camera ogled to being one of the characters whose point of view is ogling the new hot woman, you know, so I haven't watched, you know, I, I, I think the last... Yeah, the most recent thing I've watched that Cameron Diaz was in was Gangs of New York, where she's excellent. So that was also, you know, she she is really talented and has gotten some roles after, you know, the, the age that sadly a lot no longer get work past. Now... <clears throat> let's see the yeah so all of the Eternals are 7,000 years old and the writing and acting fits that you know they they felt like they've been around and you know like Kingo's pretty happy about it he likes the attention and and you know humans like giving him attention and then you have others who are more frustrated, and, and yeah. When I heard that there was going to be ten, you know, like, yeah, the, the yeah, ten, ten major characters. I, I think I read somewhere main characters, but I, I wouldn't quite say that all ten of them quite qualify as main characters, but major for sure. And, you know, I was wondering if maybe they should have combined at least a few of them, you know, to, to make sure the movie didn't have to deal with so many separate characters. Since, you know, the, the, 
the MCU is quite good at figuring out what to change and what to keep from the comics and not just trying to make everything but yeah it it's I I guess maybe part of it is that s several of the the Eternals when we meet one of them they are with another of them so you know it's it's not literally you know 10 stops along the way you know we start with let's see i guess that's technical but okay i'm not going to give away how many we start with but we start with more than one and several of the stops along the way they pick up two people two eternals at the same time at the same stop and it works really well that you see okay so you know some of these eternals have been you know completely alone for a, a long time but some of them have paired off and there are reasons why they've paired off and you can you can tell that they like there's a there's a sort of tragic beauty to it some of these people like they they kind of need each other they they they're worried what well, what what if if i'm not there to watch them what's going to happen to them you know that kind of thing and yeah one real quick Thing. I really loved that like there are so many movies where like character A will tell character B run and character B will be like I'm I'm not gonna leave you behind or, or you know why or something and in this character B actually ran and and like I know for you know some people are going to be like well, what so they just don't care no they trust character A they trust character A to not say that without good reason you know and it's it's just we've seen so many times where like the other one's like I can't leave you behind and it's just he told you to run you know he's he he gave him permission he gave consent you know, it's it, but and and here it actually does. I I really appreciated that because it demonstrated that character B trusts character A's judgment, and just yeah. So it's great that they changed some of the genders, races, sexual orientation, and such of the original. You know, the original characters were created at a time where there was an expectation that heroes were white and largely male and straight. This is no longer that time today. You know, this... I need to do better putting punctuation in my notes. This is no longer that time. Today, we celebrate the diversity found in real life. I actually, I, I, I saw someone say, well, I mean, why would... You know, uh, yeah, yeah, not a spoiler. We were told at the very start of the movie that the... Eternals are created by the Celestials. Why did the Celestials create, you know, make one of these Eternals be gay? Why would they make them straight? They're not there to reproduce. They're just there to make sure that, like, they're essentially of, of you know, a, uh, they're essentially mercenaries. They're not there to reproduce. They're not, I, I'm not even... I'm not even one hundred percent certain if, like, a, a, a an eternal and a human being can produce offspring together, or if two eternals can produce offspring together either. So, why does it matter if they're gay or straight? It's just, it's these ridiculous like we just treat straight as the norm, and and anything else as a deviation. Now, let's see the yeah. So the, the 
you know, apparently the reason they did not, the, the Eternals did not intervene when Thanos was doing his th thang. You know, in the comics, he is a deviant, so the Eternals should intervene, but, you know, I'm not sure that he's supposed to be a deviant in in the MCU, and th and that's fine. It's, it's not that important of a, you know. I do have to wonder if maybe that's why, like, in the comics, some of the deviants look a lot like human beings, but in you know you yeah you see in the trailers they're you know some of the deviants look more like lizards than than people than than human beings so now let's see is Eternals as good at handling a lot of characters as the Guardians of the Galaxy movies and the Suicide Squad not Suicide Squad but the I wouldn't say quite as good but ultimately. Yeah, a, you know, James Gunn is at least a little bit better at it. But the... I mean, Chloe Zhao does incredible with the relationships between them. And I would say there are more compelling relationships between characters in this that you know James Gunn is more the the individuals and like the overall kind of group how they play off each other but with Chloe Zhao it's she she's yeah the the you know several of the Eternals have you know some of them have platonic relationships some of them have friendships some of them have romantic relationships with each other and it really it, it hits very hard as it should now the characterization you know some of the characters we see in tremendously varied circumstances you know we see what they're like when things are going well how they respond to things going wrong Now, yeah, there are some things about this movie that stay with you long after watching. Let's see, what can I say without spoiling? The relationships. The relationship really stay with you. And, and the, yeah. So, the cinematography, you know, Chloe Zhao usually works with one specific cinematographer, I forget. The name I'm afraid but for this it was instead Ben Davis who was DP and you know he was also DP on Captain Marvel Doctor Strange Age of Ultron Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 and Wrath of the Titans so he has a lot of MCU experience and he he does a good job at, at like, you know, now, yeah, I already mentioned, I I also watched Nomadland, which was shot by her usual DP. And with this movie, like, you can tell that it's still the way that she wants the movie to be shot. You know, this is not just filmed in this completely different way from, yeah. Now... The cinematography keeps it easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. It doesn't have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. There are no unnecessary shots. Some have pointed to the tactile feel and look. And yeah, just she 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 puts such beautiful visuals on screen. Zhao does. Now, that, yeah, and that brings us to the editing, which was handled by, okay, I'm gonna try Dylan Tikinor. 
and Craig Wood. Now, Dylan also edited Lawless, The Town, There Will Be Blood, Brokeback Mountain, Unbreakable, Magnolia, and Boogie Nights. Some of the most well-edited movies ever made. And Craig Wood also edited Ant-Man and the Wasp, Guardians of the Galaxy Volumes 1 and 2, The Ring, and Pirates of the Car Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. Some uh, some very well edited MCU movies and The Ring is excellently edited. I have to admit it's been ages since I watched Pirates of the Caribbean, but yeah, and and they do a really good job here as well. The editing keeps it easy to follow. Fast moving scenes like action scenes keeps it calm, and that is called for. Now, are there scenes that should be cut, moved in the overall structure, trimmed down, increased in length? Some people really took issue with the flashbacks in this movie, and I can understand why. I personally thought that it worked. I, I kind of, like, when the first flashback started, I was a little worried because of all the reviews I re read. If, if not, I probably wouldn't have been. But it pretty quickly proved, you know, no. It, there's a good reason for it to be here. It's not just... You know, I mean, that is that is the thing with, like, she's she's basically like an indie director, Chloe Zhao is, or was before this, at least. And I love independent cinema. I think the, the when you when you get away from the constraints of studio, you know, the, a studio is always going to tell you how to make the movie. It's, it's very rare for a studio to be completely hands-off. And if they are, it's because they believe that what you deliver will be so profitable and safe that they don't have to get involved. If you're independent, you don't have to deal with that kind of thing. And independent movies can linger on things that, you know, like, like if you're making a... a fairly inexpensive independent movie you can linger on certain things and that can help make up for that it's not as big as many you know if, if you're trying to convince an american to watch a movie the moment that they hear it's independent a lot of them are going to be like oh god and when you have a big budget if you still linger then it ends up just feeling really long and and possibly aimless and that's kind of what i read that happened here and i completely disagreed i i think they did a really great job i i don't think there's anything that should just be removed or really trimmed no the effects are quite good like you know by now the you know yeah the 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 deviants are completely CG and they look very convincing. They have their, their you know, the designs are, are quite good. But something that worked really well here was that Glo Zhao used practical effects for the film as much as possible. You know, they, they didn't do very much green screen. Yeah, Gemma Chan said the filming process felt very different from what she experienced on Captain Marvel, explaining that Eternal shot more in location, utilized natural light, while Captain Marvel had more studio work and blue screen. And it works incredibly well. Like, I, I saw one critic say, you know, oh, you know, because a lot of these scenes are very talky, you have to have real place. And, and I agree, that helps. But also, when they are fighting, like, yeah, the fact that. And it's it's a pain in the ass. It is way more difficult. To, if you have the money and you have a, a green screen studio, it is so much easier to deal with than having to, you know. But yeah, but location is rewarding. And yeah, when, like, in this movie, like, there are times where the deviants will attack. And it's like, we've just, we, we, we've got, you know, we... Yeah, the the Eternals have got have gone to this place, and we the the viewer have kind of accepted. Oh, it's you know it's actually kind of a, a safe place for these you know specific. De if, uh, 
not deviants, but Eternals, and, and, you know, oh, it's, it's a good thing they can be away from people, oh, no, and then in come the deviants and attack this place that feels real, you know, it doesn't, it's not just spectacle, which I will admit for some of these movies, it is mainly spectacle. The stunt work is also excellent. And the budget was 200 million. And it shows. Yeah, so this movie was filmed. Let's see. Canary Islands. Various places in England. California. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, the, the sets are absolutely incredible. And we, we get to visit some really important places from history. Places and times from history, yeah. The action is really well handled. Very tense and suspenseful. And yeah, so we've got yeah chases on foot, physical fights, superpowers... Yeah, I I read that you know some some critics said that Chloe Zhao doesn't seem to care about the action scenes. I really don't agree. I I felt like there was it, it didn't feel to me like oh okay it's been so and so long gotta have an action scene let's just get it over with. Like there are important character moments in the action scene. Now, the music, Raman Jawadi scores this movie and he also scored Blade Trinity. I mean, that it does have good music. And 2008's Iron Man, the, the first one, which his score for that movie is incredible. It's, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people criticize the scores of MCU movies, and for sure some of them, it's, they don't get as interesting or, or risk, you know, take, take as many risks as some others, such as DCU, but the score for Iron Man 1 is, is excellent, like, if, if it's been a while since you watched that movie, watch it again and just, just take in the music it's it's yeah i i saw someone say that you know they they kind of it, it felt muted for this you know for, for this movie i mean that kind of i feel like that's that was kind of necessary for this movie it, like if he had gone full iron man in this one it wouldn't have worked now yeah, another critic said that the score sounds amazing in all of the scenes, mixed with the fights, which are just epic and creative. I've got no other words to express myself. And so when I before I watch a movie, I, I have this this document that I make a copy of and then I put in specific notes for you know copying in Who's the DP? What other stuff have they DP'd that I have seen or am aware of or stuff like that? I added one called Musical Numbers. And it was essentially an in-joke, completely for myself, because nobody else reads these notes. But, you know, it was basically like, yeah, right. Because I'm, I'm sure, eventually, maybe I'll review a musical. Like... It is extremely rare for me to watch a musical, much less review one. Don't get me wrong. It takes an extreme amount of talent to do a good musical or musical number. I just don't have the background to do a good job reviewing it. But this movie has a Bollywood scene. And, yeah, they, they do a good job. Like, it, it, I've, I don't think I've seen a real Bollywood scene ever. Only clips. Because some of the, the reviewers that I like like Bollywood movies and so they'll talk about them on occasion but yeah like it looked real like the the lighting and costumes and dancing and yeah 
the sound design is great. You know, the since a lot of the time the Eternals do look human, the audio has to do a lot of work to sell that these are beings that come from outside of Earth, and it does quite a good job. Like, for example, their, their powers, you know, Fastos can build something in the air, and you'll hear the things, you know, like, yeah, the, the, I mean, it's essentially like, you know, we, we've seen, Iron, we've seen Tony Stark build an Iron Man suit with just using like an, a, a computer interface, you know, and Fastos just does it with powers, superpowers instead. And, you know, Thena making these spears and such. Uh, yeah. We see them being created, and then we hear these noises of them being created. And, yeah. Now, the, the comedy, I felt, worked. Like, I, you know, I try not to rag too hard on, but I did think Black Widow pushed a little too hard. I don't care. I don't, I don't mind that they made the the most prominently featured male character be the the punchline that doesn't bother me i it you know i don't i why why should it have to be a woman why should you know why can't the most prominent man be a, a walking punchline my problem was that they pushed a little too far and had punchlines in scenes that i really felt would have worked better if they just let it play out, you know. I don't think this movie has that same problem. You know, it, it doesn't go as hard trying to, tr yeah, trying for jokes. I actually saw one critic say that the, the comedy was dry, and yeah, some of it is. It works really well. Now, yeah, so so this isn't as fast-paced as most of the MCU movies, but I wouldn't say that it's slow. And, yeah, so this, uh, yeah, I didn't write down exactly, but I want to say it's like 2 hours and 17 minutes or something like that. It's, yeah, and some people have said it's too long. I think if it was much longer, it would be too long. But I think it just, you know, it, it just stops short of being overly long. Now, the best element of the movie is probably the, the you know, philosophical ideas, the drama, the representation and diversity. It's yeah best elements I'm, I'm gonna and I would say it's worth watching at least once for those now let's see the worst aspect I mean if I yeah if I have to be 100% brutally honest I think the movie would probably be at least a little better if at least a little bit of what is currently in the film exposition if some of that was handled visually you know visual yeah visual storytelling now i i don't think it's a particularly good a particularly big deal and yeah you know if you go into the movie knowing that it's there's a lot of talking then I you know it won't bother you as much now I suppose that does cover let's see. yeah the thing I was most worried about the movie I, I was worried it would be confusing because it tries to cover so much and the movie exceeded my expectations. I really was not confused. And the, you know, 
I was most looking forward to the diversity and seeing some extremely comic book ideas on screen. And the movie exceeded my expectations. The trailers give away too much, but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not like the trailer. The cover and poster don't give away too much, and they give a good idea of what the movie is like. Now. So. It. It has 53% on the tomato meter based on 187 reviews. Oh, 37, not 17. Two hours and 37 minutes. And, yeah, currently the critics' consensus is an ambitious superhero epic that soars as often as it strains. Eternals take the MCU in intriguing and occasionally confounding new directions. And, yeah, the, the average rating... For critics is 5.70 out of 10 and of the 187 a hundred of them are fresh but the remaining 87 are rotten it was fresh until the the first of this month you know and until it had 126 reviews it was still fresh but when it yeah from the second of this month and it's now the fourth fifth you know when it had at least 144 reviews it got it it rotted and on metacritic it has 53 out of 100 based on 47 metacritic reviews and on imdb it has a 6.5 out of 10 i found 32 use imdb user reviews but i haven't checked since watching the movie and 106 links in the IMDb external reviews section and 65 of them that were in English you know I'm I'm not that multilingual and yeah so on IMDb the the user votes I mean 34.4 percent voted 10 and 19.2 voted one yeah you gotta really think the movie doesn't work to give it a one anyway so yeah the the movie does not have a lot of violence it's again it's it's the pg-13 violence where they don't look you know the the beings being attacked don't look that much like humans so it's okay to make them bleed and cut off parts of their body, stab them in the head and stuff like that. But, you know. And, yeah, it has a tiny bit of sexual material. The, the... <clears throat> you know, IMDb trivia notes, it's the first MCU film since The Incredible Hulk to receive a PG-13 rating for sexual content alongside violence. And... Obviously, it's not like this big thing, but I think it was worth putting, pun not intended, yeah, I think including that was worth it. I think it would have been too bad if it meant it got an R, but yeah. Now... This is capital C cinema. And I copied in a lot of stuff that I'm going to skim through. Because, yeah, I copied in a lot of stuff. Okay. So. Some of the stuff that they removed from the, that, that, you know, isn't in the movie, even though, you know, some of the comics, I really appreciate that they changed. Yeah. Right. So, the, the, let's see. 
Yeah, some people said that you know some of the superpowers are handled better in other movies like fast movement, flying, and laser eyes and such. And I cared more when Icarus got his Superman on in this than when Superman got his Superman on in the Zack Snyder movies. I personally really, like, apparently, um, I want to say Lauren Ridloff, you know, apparently she, she decided to run in a very specific war, way, and the, the, I forget if it was her or Chloe Zhao who made the point that, you know, the, the other fast runner, you know, super speed runners in these movies are male. And yeah, you know, we've had two Quicksilvers, both male. We have one movie flash. I feel like I've heard there's at least two flashes on the TV show and both of them are, are male. Although Calypso and X-Men 3, I think, was also supposed to be a fast run. But, you know, that is the only exception to that. But, yeah. Right. And I saw someone criticize, you know, the flashbacks don't tell the movie's story. So when there's a flashback, we're just waiting for the flashback to end so the story can progress. I felt they added enough. And I didn't... Yeah. But I, I can understand why. And, and certainly, like, we are now, like, the idea of flashbacks that don't further the plot, you know, that's not really necessary anymore. I Like, was it maybe Lost that, that kind of changed, like, ah, well, I guess, nah, Lost, it was, like, big clues. It wasn't plot progression in the in the actual flashbacks but they were but but yeah you know there it used to be that oh you know flashback sure whatever however many you want however long you want especially in novels but in movies today we do kind of expect you know if, if you're gonna do a, a flashback there has to be something really important there but i would say the movie has you know anyway and the movie features many different languages, many different peoples. Communicating that the movie is about there is only one human race, and we have more in common than you think, which is incredibly relevant now that countless refugees are being turned away at the borders of a number of countries. So this is this is exactly the right message to be sending, and I hope it can help and inspire empathy in those that. Just look at, you know, and and all they see is, oh, you know, they just, they're they're dangerous. We have to keep them out of here, and yeah. So yeah, I recommend this to big fans of the MCU, the cast, and Chloe Zhao. And like philosophical kind of like, I saw someone s describe the movie as it's. A story about angels questioning God. If that appeals to you at all, then I think it's worth watching the movie. Yeah. I give this movie eight eternal beings that have lived among us for thousands of years out of ten. And that brings us to the spoiler sections. The thoughts sections of the movie. Starting with disclaimers. So, if you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers. Since a lot of this is very standard information, I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during the section. Once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So, once again, final warning. From here on out, spoilers for this movie, and also for earlier movies in the franchise. So yeah, the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts, some analysis, some MCK riff cracks and other jokes. And...
So yeah, the, the section right after this one is thoughts that I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of this as running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And so does the movie does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? Yes, I I would say that it. Uh, I, I mean, I guess the very least likable is probably Crow. I want to say his name was the the head deviant, but even he has some like. I mean, the movie. You know, he once he gets the the once he becomes able to speak words, he says. You killed me and my, you, you know, you've killed my brothers for all these years. You're not heroes. You're killers. And I will kill you for, for all of my kin that you've killed. And it's such a brilliant, because it's, that is exactly it. They are just trying to survive. And it's, it's such a, it's, it's, these are the kinds of things that we need to have, like, it's exactly right. It's ex 100%. Like, I I really, I loved how this movie makes you think and the, the things that, that the, the subjects that it brings up, you know, yeah, of course we do feel some, like, like when we see Thena manage to get free and kill Crow, like, we, you know, it feels like a victory for her. You know, she's getting revenge. For Gilgamesh, she's ah, what's the word? And she, you know, it, the the um, yeah. But at the same time, it is also like yeah, we we empathize with him. We empathize, with, you know. I saw someone say that um, Icarus was like Homelander, but worse, or something like that, and, you know. I can see what they mean, but, like, he has good reason. Like, he literally... It's the trolley problem. Like, it literally is. He says... If you kill... The, uh, not Isherim, right? Because Isherim was already out there. I'm, I'm not sure. Wait, Tiam Tiamat. Was that what they called him? If you kill Tiamat, he won't go out there and create billions of other lives but in order for him to create billions of other lives he has to kill billions of people here you know it's it's the trolley problem and they literally just come up on on different sides of that i really appreciated like even after like like after they managed to stop tiamat they're not like attacking icarus because they understand where he came from and icarus isn't like going nuts and just attacking them because you know he 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 basically realizes that the you know the the thing that he hoped to achieve has now failed and i mean what's it's not going to do any good to attack his family Yeah, the movie has empathy for the least likable characters, and I think that was the right choice. Like, it is it is extremely clear. Chloe Zhao has an immense amount of empathy. Now, let's see. So, the... I like how much this movie gives the, the female characters to do. So many of these movies... I mean, maybe it does in part come with casting such big names. Uh, you know, I mean, who's who's going to tell Angelina Jolie? Oh, you get you just get the bit part. You know, no nobody puts Jolie in a bit part, and you know, a female director who has a strong vision, a strong voice. She's not just going to let someone else decide that kind of thing, but. Yeah, we more of these movies should have the the female characters having a lot to do. At the start of the movie, I'm gonna try the names. Yeah, 
ah, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, okay, I'm not going to spend forever. Um, Salma Hayek's Ajak, that's it. At the start of the movie, Ajak is the leader. To, you know, the, the, and, and later, Cersei is the one who can communicate with the Celestia, I, I forget the, the, but, but yeah. And, you know, that becomes a huge part of, of the, the, the fact that she, you know, the whole Unimind thing, that's, you know, wouldn't work without her. And so many movies would have had one of the dudes be, you know, the one who could. So, yeah. Now. That brings us to... The next section, notes taken while watching. So, it is a major thing in the comics that the Deviants are genetically evil, which is seriously messed up. And a little weird, considering that they were created by Jack Kirby, a Jewish man himself, who would know all about people claiming for an entire group to be genetically evil. Jews, like deviants, have been claimed to always start and wage wars. So, yeah, I was kind of hoping that this movie would try to subvert that, and my idea was maybe one or more of the deviants would be decidedly not genetically evil, maybe many, even all, but then I guess it might be too soon after they did that with the Skrulls and Captain Marvel, and really the other thing they did is they're literally just fighting to survive, you know, oh yeah, like oh, apex predators. Yeah, because it's they're they're literally just fighting to survive. They're they're no, you know, yeah. So so, yeah, they 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 got that. I was hoping, you know, it's the MCU. I I I almost I'm 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 almost completely beyond ever doubting that the MCU is gonna make something work. Not saying they're flawless. Not saying that they never get things even a tight you know some, sometimes they they mess up minor things but the the stuff that really matters they almost always get right now i do think you know they don't say specifically one way or the other if the eternals were i guess yeah i'm not entirely sure If the Eternals... No, I guess they, they probably weren't dusted. And, yeah, I with, without that, I'm not sure why they couldn't help fight Thanos, considering it wasn't just about Earth. It was about 50% of all of creation. At that point, it doesn't really make sense to adhere to a rule that says that, you know, only get involved if... if uh, Yeah, but ultimately, I mean, I don't think, when when they were making Endgame, I don't think they were intending to make an actual Eternals movie, you know, featuring a, yeah, you know, the Eternals, the, the Celestials had been mentioned in, in the Guardians films especially, but an actual Eternals movie. Anyway, going to my notepad that I took notes during the actual watching of the movie, and yeah, the opening of the of the ship flying past the sun looks absolutely amazing. I really like that the Eternals fight as a unit, and we're told in the opening crawl that the Celestials created the universe, which. So, so yeah, basically, you know, what, what is that joke from that abridged script? God has been telefragged by the Celestials. I like that some, you know, in the, in the Marvel Studios logo, a little bit of the first of the, of the artwork that, you know, was, was like vintage Kirby artwork. I, 
I didn't pick up if it was Eternals, but I could imagine that they, they specifically picked that. And I don't know how I feel about they they literally took the character who's been around for seven thousand years and they made it a running thing that she she, she gets she's late for things. Like that's that's almost too too silly and uh, you get it do you get it because she has all the time in the world you see so she wouldn't always realize that she needs to leave because five minutes earlier to get there in time you see this, this is a little bit that's that's not my favorite thing about the movie let's just say And I, I liked the scene where, you know, Cersei comes in and, and Dane is, what was it like? He's, he's like reciting poetry or something because he doesn't, like he, you know, someone had to cover for her. And he doesn't know the, the thing that they were going to talk about or something like that. And just, you know, them meeting and then, you know, the, they're like, oh, we'll, we'll see you later tonight or something like that. And then the, you know, the class goes, ooh, that's just, yeah, I don't know. I, I liked it. And I, I really like that one of the very first times, at least, that we see Sprite. I, I'm not 100% certain it is the very first time, but we don't see her, you know, we yeah, we don't see Leah McHugh. We see... A yeah, we we see the person that she was posing as, and you know she's she's been talking to this guy, and he tries to put his hand on on hers as this you know aff affection thing, but his hand goes right through hers, and he's like, "What's going on?" And she's like, "Oh, this this could be bad, so I have to you know, so, you're you're so drunk," or and I did she say I have to go or something like that, and she just gets up and walks away and and as soon as she's out of his sight she turns back into sprite and it's this thing of like here we go again you know lasted as long as it could you know there, there's no way he she, she's not going to be able to convince him that that somehow you know and if he saw her the way she actually looks He'd be like, "Ew, that's you're, you're way too young for me," you know. So, I I thought they did a really great job of of just, in, you know, immediately you get what her existence is like. I appreciate that we get to present day very early in the film. You know, the if I had to guess based on the trailers, I would have thought that they would spend at least some time. In ancient Mesopotamia and just you know I don't know 10 15 minutes there or something but it's more like two or three minutes and most of that time spent fighting and I like that you know the the Dane is is like wait is it, you know I mean Sprite told me that you've been together that that you were that that you left each other a hundred years ago and and you know and and Cersei is like Sprite did you really tell him that Dane did you really believe me when I told you it's a it's a good you know like I said in the review she's kind of poking and, and prodding it's like I don't really like this Dane guy Ugh, it's so frustrating nobody takes me seriously you know I bet I, I could make Dane like because because he's like a hundred years, you say. That's interesting. That's 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 very interesting. Thank you, thank you, Sprite. I also, so so he knows her as Sprite. Like, I I have to admit that was kind of like because nobody really does have a a an alter ego in this movie, do they? Like some people do know that. Eternals are Eternals, others don't, but everyone just goes by the same, like, I mean, Cersei, yeah, I, I guess someone could, could go by that, but Sprite, 
I don't know. I, I just feel like that's too comic booky of a name for someone to accept as a... Because he does also... He's like, are you like Doctor Strange? I, I'm just saying, if I lived in a world that had Doctor Strange and I was introduced to a character, to someone who went by the name of Sprite, I would either think that they were, like... Really pretentious, I guess, like as a as a sort of statement, or I would assume, oh, so you're like superhuman in some way, right? Just, just, yeah. I really liked when we saw, you know, the deviant self heal, and like immediately, it's like, oh no, that's what Ajax knows how to do, you know. And and I think, I think when we see that, we haven't actually seen Ajax do, but then we get the flashback that shows, right? And when they when they're in Babylon, that's when we should we see. I actually I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, the, this thing of like oh the deviant killed Ajax for her powers, and and that's a yeah that's really really clever. And we're introduced to Athena's PTSD when she attacks the other Eternals, and this whole idea like Ajax just. I mean, she basically decrees it, but the others argue, and so she's like, you know what, I think we're maybe at the point where I don't want to be telling you what you have to do if you have such strong moral objections to it. And, and you know, the PTSD cure is to take Athena's memories away, and, and it prompts this major discussion. And actually, I mean... If I understand correctly, Ajax knew. Like, when, when they're talking about, but she won't be herself anymore. You can't take her memories. That's wrong. You know, some of them. Others are like, well, it's the only way. But Ajax hears that, and she's like, oh, wow. The, the whole thing that we've been doing, because she's the only of the Eternals who knows that the Celestials erase all of their memories when they're done with a planet. And just... Yeah, that's, that's, and, and that is the thing, like, the, the, you know, in real life, the, the, I'm, I'm almost certain I've heard that there were some, you know, possible, like, some, some things that are done to, I, I, hmm, I don't remember if it's PTSD specifically, but some mental, ailments you know there are some things that can help or at least make the person less dangerous to others but some of those things will harm that person's yeah memories or sense of self and and these kinds of things take take away some of their decision making abilities things like that and i i really like you know sprite reminds thena who she is to to help, you know, the with with the PTSD, you know, she uses her powers to to show her the I, I yeah, and yeah, we find out that Earth is, you know, has has a celestial inside, and we get the whole circle of life, you know, thing with with yeah. And we find out that the Celestials are robots, which, and, and, yeah, all of their memories are always erased and reset when they get to a new planet. It's, I, I, I don't think I've ever personally read a book of, of Eternals, but I'm almost certain that they're not robots in the comics. They are aliens, and there is an actual planet that they're, or wait, ah, in the comics, it's not a planet, it's a something or other but not a planet apparently it's it's a little hazy but the yeah i i really liked the, the this whole it, it was it was a really intelligent idea and it was explored really well and yeah you know the movie brings up are the eternals good or evil and certainly once they know the truth at that point, it really is 
you can't just pretend anymore. Before, you could just say, well, we're the good guys. The big guy upstairs says we're the good guys, so we're just going to do the thing he told us to do. Now they know, you know, the, 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 the Eternals are no more, you know, they're, they're not some, they're, they're not better than the, the, the Deviants are. The Deviants were, if, if, if I understand correctly, basically the Deviants were the first attempt at trying to, to, you know, get the, the power of a planet to, for the the or wait was the any, anyway the deviants were an uh, an experiment but the experiment went completely out of their control so they had to create the eternals to stop the deviants from taking over i really like the bit where druig makes all the cult fire guns at the Deviant, that was a really clever kind of, yeah. And I, I have, I, when the movie had, I, I forget exactly, he, was it, was it killing Gilgamesh, maybe? When Crow killed, in, you know, killed enough of the Eternals, he, he got, you know, he, he evolved again. And his features became more human, and then he could start speaking in English. And he wasn't saying nonsense words. He was specifically talking to them, saying, I am aware that you have been killing my kind for centuries. I guess millennia, really. And I I am going to kill you for that. You know, the the... It's just, it's such a, I mean, that, that really is just, just like, a lot of people make fun of, of vegans, and I honestly, I probably myself done it in, in some videos, but I, I, I'm just saying I, I'm I'm not trying to make fun here. I feel like that's basically that's you know that that's it's it's if if you were vegan then when you looked at an animal you would see a person, basically. You know, and I'm I'm yeah, there's probably gonna be people who, who find that really Oh, that's right. Yeah. I read some some reviewer who said oh they 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 go in a in a they try to go in an interesting direction, but it ends up disturbing and even disgusting. I guess that's what they're referring to. Otherwise, I'm not really sure what they're referring to in this movie that's disgusting. But yeah, now I I I thought it was brilliant. I I it's it's I'm I'm not gonna get into veganism. It, in in you know I I think the ethics are important to go into. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I was not expecting, when I, when I sat down to watch this movie, I was not expecting major character death. Of so, so over the course of the movie, Ajax, Gilgamesh, and Icarus die permanently in the movie and and by the end of the movie sprite is no longer an eternal she's human so yeah i i it's it's and that's the kind of thing you can do when it's when it's a movie where like let's be honest if We would have had an extremely hard time to believe. I, I mean, yeah, we, we did. We did have a hard time believing when, you know, one of the main Avengers was being threatened with death in whether it's a solo movie or a team-up movie, you know, especially in, like, the first two of the major team-up, you know. Yeah, the 
the first two Avengers movies, like, I, I distinctly remember, like, some people were really angry that about the fake-out death of, of Tony at the end of the movie, because obviously he's not going to... It would be ridiculous for them to kill off Tony Stark when he, like, if, if not for Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark, the MCU would either be significantly smaller or not have launched at all. Like, if, if people didn't care that much about his character in the, you know, yeah, in the first movie. So obviously killing him wouldn't... But you can do that with, with something like this. You know, we don't know who's going to live or die to the end of the movie. And yeah, I, I thought that was really, really compelling. I like how every single time the the Eternals, you know, go meet someone that, you know, yeah, go meet another Eternal, they introduce themselves as friends from college. I, I, an, another thing I really appreciate, like this philosophical, this, this mind, you know, this, this idea that really screws with your mind. Basically, the celestial in in the Earth is basically treating the our planet as a, a source of energy that it can just use, and it's such a it's like because that's how a lot of human beings treat the planet. Like a, a lot of powerful people act like they can just keep taking things like like great yeah sapping natural resources without caring the about the effect it has and again this movie comes and and flips that on its head and it's like well how would you feel if you were the 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 resource that was being you know because because that's the thing like why is why should earth why should we human beings be more important to a gigantic alien being inside Earth when to so many human beings, Earth itself is, is just something to be used. So, yeah. I, I thought it was extremely sweet when the, the gay couple kissed goodbye. I really appreciate it. It wasn't just like, you know, oh, there's just brief kiss or brief mention of gay. No, like the, the every single time that two or more of the of the people are on screen, like if or, or yeah, even if just the the kid is in the other room, you know, when like when fast is when Thena is over and fast is like, oh, excuse me, excuse me, and goes over, to, ah, you know, it's a cover, cover your ears, cover your ears. You know, do, do not do that again. You know, your your babysitting privileges are completely revoked. And I I like that we see, you know, Makari took a lot of things from around the 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 world and put them on the ship. And she actually, I I I really love this detail. When they get there, she's speed reading this book and she doesn't pause when they get there she finishes the book I, I forget if she throws it or just puts it down and she's like oh so we're leaving right because like it's only going to take her a couple of seconds to finish the book why would she take a break she might as well finish it i just yeah and we get the flashback of Ajax and Icarus talking and yeah and and Ajax actually you know she says she says something like I led you it's my fault you walked down this path something like that you know and yeah I I thought that was a, a really neat like she she's not like oh you know curse you just no she she and and you know, Icarus explains, I, I was never going to let you, you know, I, I have to protect um, 
this celestial, I forget the name again. But I wasn't going to let you be killed by the deviants. And the the volcano with the emergence, that's just such a, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's Chloe Zhao, so of course she's going to find some way to make it beautiful, but just the, I've seen it, I've seen movies where volcanoes erupt before, I'm not new, I've, it's, it's, it's a thing, you know, we have been fascinated with volcanic eruptions for an extremely long time now, but I don't think I've ever seen it look so beautiful, and just this, because it is, like, that's the thing, you know, it's, a, a volcano isn't just, like, uh, let's see, what's a, what's an example, it's, it's not just destruction, you know, like, a, a house fire, that's just destruction, but a volcanic eruption, like, there is, it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's not just, you know, something, something being destroyed, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful sight, and it's a beautiful process, it's an impressive process, like, that, that's part of why we're so fascinated by volcanoes, because it's, again, like, if you light, if you light wood on fire, it'll burn for a while, but a volcano, like, all the, all the, just, and, and the idea of a volcanic eruption leading to something living, destroying Earth, I mean, I mean, isn't that, I feel like that's basically what certain tribes interpreted volcano, volcanic eruptions as, like, they're like, oh, that's it, you know, we knew it was going to happen one day or another, God is rising from the Earth, nothing we can do, you know, Hopefully we we made the most of our time here on Earth, but to to actually make it that you know I it, yeah, and I really like that yeah you know here at the end it's the it's Icarus versus a bunch of the other Celestials, and yeah some. Um, Athena versus Icarus, and I really liked when Makari was like running and and like you know she'll like run and punch Icarus and then run and punch him from the other side over and over again. That was that was a great uh, yeah. And and again like I I'm not sure. Yeah, it it was it was new. It it was a new thing to to. Or at least the way that it was shown. There was there was something new about it. And I like, you know, Fasta said, Icarus, I've been wanting to clip your wings for a while. Because, yeah. Uh, I really like that here at the end, like, over the course of the movie, for a while, it just seemed like, okay, so, like, at, at the very start of the movie, we're basically presented with the idea that the Eternals are the good guys, the Deviants are the bad guys, and the Celestials shouldn't really be questioned. You know, they know better. And then over the course of the movie, you realize the the, the Eternals themselves, not all of them, like, we don't know who we can trust and who we can't. And it, I, I mean, that is at, at the end of the day, you know, they might, it's, they might last longer, but they are very human, you know. I, that some of them, some of them can be trusted, some of them cannot. And I, I really appreciate. There's not a single one-note bad guy character in this movie. Like Crow, the moment he became a character, he, he expressed that he wasn't just uh um uh, you know yeah that that he wasn't just some voiceless monster i overall that probably could have done more crow could have been more compelled like it was the, when when crow before crow spoke 
Crow was intense and, and intimidating and such. And then once Crow developed the ability to speak, was there, there was some really great... Ah, what's the word? It's right on the tip of my tongue. Pathos. There was some pathos there. But then Thena just kills Crow, and that's basically it. And just... Yeah, ultimately wasn't... But it, it was really cool how, you know, we know that she can make speed, you know, spears, swords and such. And Crow, you know, ties her hands behind, which is also great. There's so many movies where a woman gets tied up and a man has to come save her. But she saves herself. And Crow completely underestimated her. You know, so she, she forms the things, cuts the ropes, and then cuts him and, and it does the thing with the slow sliding, which some people really hate. I think it's perfectly fine. And I have to admit, I haven't seen it for some years now. So it was it was fun to see that again. Like, didn't I, I feel like there's at least one of the Underworld movies that did that kind of thing. But that was all the way back then, you know. When it, well, yeah, one of the first Underworld movies. I mean, actually, yeah. When was a lot... They actually... They kept making those for a while with... Basically nothing staying constant except for Kate Beckinsale. So, anyway. But yeah, you know, Fastos ties Icarus to the ground. That was a really clever... Yeah. I really liked that, like, every time we saw either Ajax or Cersei commune with the... the with Arishem, I want to say. You know, we'll see, like... Oh wow, you know, he's this big and she's you know, tiny little speck. And then here at the end, you know, and, and yeah, and at least one point we see the massive hand and you know, again, tiny little speck of, of character. And then here at the end, the hand yeah, the hand was coming out of the volcano or something like that. Yes, yeah. Something along those lines. So I I thought that was a really great kind of cause there at the start, you know, over the course of the movie when we see the, the celestial, we don't we ah wait, actually wait never mind now that i think about it by the time we see how big no no yeah no when we first see when we get a glimpse of how big a celestial is we don't think about there being a celestial in the earth cuz that we only find that out a little bit into the movie so anyway and yeah you know, Icarus has accepted that his, the, the, ah, what's it called? Yeah, you know, he's, he f flies too close to the sun and, uh, you know, doesn't come back down to Earth afterwards. And Sprite becomes human with the good and the bad. And I gotta say, like, when, you know, in the trailer you see the, the, drawing of the of the blade by by sprite you know and then you see in the movie and it's like yeah she's gonna stab some deviant with it and then here at the end you know suddenly ajax shows up we we know it's got to be sprite trying to mess with her trying to wear down her you know and then and we see the blade sticking out and just it's heartbreaking because she you know they've they've she they've taken care of each other for so long. I mean, what is it supposed to be like hundreds of years? Oh, and that's why that's why Sprite tells Dane. Cersei used to be with Icarus. They broke up a hundred years ago. It's not just to mess with Dane. Then you know I think it is in part that too, but it's because she's obsessed with it. She's thinking I can't believe it. it's been a hundred years since I saw him last. Because she loves him. Yeah, it's it's just such a... Yeah, and I think it's Cersei who says, you know, the truth will set the, etern the, the other Eternals free as well. And the Celestial will judge them based on their memories. And we get the mid credit scene of Star Fox. I... It looks... It looks like it's going to be a ton of fun. I cannot wait to see it. 
I really hope that this movie does well enough that we do get more of the Eternals and these light. I saw someone say, ah, I can't believe you brought a pop star into it. Have you seen Dunkirk? He's an, he's legitimately an incredibly talented actor. Like, okay, I get, and, and besides, you know, I was, I was talking with my friend about this. And we were like, I mean, he's the perfect fit for this character. He's supposed to be like this really charming kind of, he's, he's, he's absolutely perfect. I mean, it's not like they, they cast some, you know, completely an un untalented person who is just only known for their music. Like, I've only seen Harry Styles in that one movie, but A, he took a role that he, it doesn't make him look good, and B, he acts the crap out of it. Like, it is such a strong performance. Like, I knew that he was a pop star going into the movie because every so often he'll pop up. His, his face will be in, you know... This or that. I, I don't... I didn't really follow the music. I don't... You know. Whatever. It's not my kind of music. Some people love that kind of music. I'm glad for them. But... If I didn't know that he was... Like, I, I would have thought that he was just an actor. I wouldn't have thought, oh, it's a pop star pretending to be an actor. Like, wasn't there... No, well, let's see. I... I feel like Justin Timberlake... I've, I've heard he can act. I'm not sure... Oh wait, right, yeah, he was in he was in in time. I yeah, he he was pretty good in that. I feel like aren't there at least some pop stars who tried to act? Yeah, whatever. I'm I'm sure some exist, but like that's really not a good example of one. And we get the post credit scene of the Black Knight of of Dane, you know, about to to touch the sword and and just. And you get the voice. Are you sure you're ready for that, Mr. Whitman? I just... <laughs> I, I, I cannot wait. It's going to be so cool to, to see more of the Celestials. And, the, yeah. But the, um, that was everything I had written down. I'm just going to real quick see if there is anything that I wanted to let's see that I wanted to say that I didn't write down yet um, I thought every character got some moments you know good character moments and some good moments in action scenes. No character was just forgotten about. I really appreciate that, like, so frequently when you see, you know, a character like Druid would be, like, the bad guy, and we're not supposed to think about how, you know, what it's like to be him but I mean imagine imagine that all you had to do was focus and you could stop wars you could you could prevent all conflict like it would it would really mess with your head you know and him him having this little cult and they're ready to you know he he like, didn't each of them have a gun, or at least a, a bunch of them each had a gun and was ready to, to, you know, a fully loaded gun, ready to shoot at, like, deviants and just... And, and at least one of the other Eternals was like, you can't, you, you can't use humans as a weapon. We're here to, you know, we're, we're not here to, to use them as, as this kind of... Yeah. And... Yeah, I I really th I thought several of the these character relationships were just, just just so beautiful and and so you know let, I I felt like there was at least one critic who pointed out you know you need Chloe Zhao you need someone with this much empathy and who's this this good at humanizing 
to to make palatable these ten beings who yeah they look human but they live for seven thousand years and they have superpowers they don't age you know all these things that just make it yeah I kind of want a a like multiverse crossover where Cersei and Diana meet Diana Prince in case I wasn't clear enough and yeah I I was just I think that is everything I I feel like they they found a way for everyone's uh cosmic power cosmic power powered power was you know seemed like really useful for the kind of thing you know did yeah didn't sprite yeah yeah sprite used she she created illusions to to get them to safety because sprite and cersei are not fighters you know they 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 don't have powers that enable them to to fight really well they so they have to hide and and run and that yeah i that was that was really really clever and actually yeah the reason that the the deviant could see through that that was because it had already killed ajak and had absorbed her power yeah really really clever and and just you know some some really beautiful like this this thing of you know a, a bus is thrown at Cersei, and her ability is to change, you know, change matter into other matter, and so she changes, I want to say it's like rose petals, so the whole bus becomes rose petals, and that's, it's a, it's a, you know, that's, that's such a sweet, like, I mean, essentially, she, you know, she could have turned it into, like, I don't know, soap bubbles or something, but rose petals is is beautiful and it's it's and and they're like apparently like at least some of those rose petals were really there on location like i'm i'm i, I don't know exactly like like when the entire thing just gets turned into is it possible that they had like a load of it just got dumped into the air and then they filmed the yeah i'm I'm not 100 percent sure but for at least some of it it that really was rose petals and just yeah i think yeah that is that is everything so if you like this video please comment thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be a link to my main channel page one two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on a movie, and recently the viewers' videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.